the tendency to progress. Look here, these are actually varieties of the melancholy. This is a half, and this is more than a half, quarter, three quarters, more than three quarters, and classification of the whole family. So it changed, it may change by time. And not only this, even the density of the metal cataract may increase by time. A faint opacity and it becomes a very uh, opacified, totally opacified disc. It even by age may be calcified. And may extend to total lens opacity or even intumescence. So there is marked variation and progression. These cataracts are not indicated for surgery. This is the blue dot cataract. Again, when you follow them up, in literature they are written that they are stationary. But sometimes with age, they may be associated with cortical spoke-like cataract and becomes indicated. Coronary cataract is not indicated for surgery. However, this is a coronary cataract that did progress more visually significant opacity in a patient who was Down syndrome and 45 years old and not complaining. Spoke-like opacities may progress with time until reaching even a total cataract. Suture, even sutural cataract here started to appear opacities around the sutures and also may be associated with different types of other morphology as coronary cataract, here blue dot cataract, uh, lamellar cataract, or even a total cataract. Indicated if sutural indicated for us. Sutural per se is not indicated for surgery, but if associated with other type of morphology, that's why, why do I'm bringing you this? It's, it's not a Quran Karim. Sutural cataract is not indicated. No. Sutural cataract if associated with other morphologies now becomes indicated for surgery. If you look to this opacity, this is not indicated for surgery. Neither this opacity. Okay? However, actually it is indicated because these opacities are present in these twin sisters. Why? Sometimes these opacities, yes, they do not observe visual equity, but they cause an isometropia. There is a minus eight causing minus eight myopia in one eye. There is a mark, an isometropia. And here, do we go for LASIK? Of course not, because the etiology is the lens. So we go for lensectomy, we go for cataract surgery in these cases, despite being faint opacities. Anterior polar cataract, we said, of course, this is not indicated for surgery. However, if it's associated with abnormality in the anterior capsule like that, as we said, this is sort of anterior lenticonus, sometimes associated with marked astigmatism that cannot be corrected with spectacles. We go for surgery in such cases, even if the lens is clear. And as we said, sometimes associated with adhesion to the back surface of the cornea, increasing marked uh, convexity of the lens like that. We tried in Alexandria University to go for surgery and cut these bands in order to decrease the curvature of the cornea, uh, the curvature of the lens, but actually it did persist. And we had to go for cataract surgery in these eyes. Uh, this concerning the indication. Systemic evaluation. Why do we examine the child systemically? I have a cataract. I go for surgery. I'm a phthalmologist. No. It's a teamwork. You should refer to a pediatrician and you should have your own pediatrician to diagnose systemic problems. Because if you look at this baby, this is indicated for surgery. But if I go for surgery for such a child, I may lose him on table. He may die on table. Because as we said in the no, previous lecture, he has a cytomegalovirus infection, and there is failure to thrive. And there is jaundice and hepatospinal megaly. He may die from you on table. Uh, again, this is indicated for surgery, but with systemic evaluation, it came out to be hypoparathyroidism. If you go for surgery for, for this child, again, he may die during general anesthesia from tetany, so he has to be controlled before surgery. If you go for this baby, it is indicated for surgery. Like that, I will go for unnecessary surgery because we said before, this is a case of galactosemia. I just restrict the, 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 the galactose free diet, the cataract may be reversible. So I will go for unnecessary surgery. And take care while performing cataract surgery in Down syndrome because they have heart problems. So it has to be controlled and you have to go for echo, cardiography, in order to proceed with surgery. 
we should control any septic for sign. Like that baby with trisomy 13 having an acronym abscess. Sometimes we go for, as in this baby with, with, with a DCR, and she had a DCR at the age of six months. That's why this is not the age of DCR, in order to control the infection, to go for future cataract surgery. We can go for surgery for such children with abscess, skin abscess like that, because there is a risk of endophthalmitis. Commonly congenital cataract, you may see congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Again, you should treat it even if you go for probing for such a child in order to go for cataract surgery safely to avoid seeing endothermites. What is the earliest age at which to consider IR implantation? It depends upon two things. It depends upon the age and the bilaterality of cataract. In cases of bilateral cataract or unilateral congenital cataract. In cases of bilateral congenital cataract, I go for cataract surgery and postpone IR implantation after the age of two years. However, in cases of unilateral congenital cataract, I can go for cataract surgery and IR implantation as early as six months. And the earliest age at which I did consider IR implantation was three months, not less than three months. Preoperative examination. Of course, if it is possible to go for slit lamp examination for these children in order to detect the morphology of cataract, to see whether the cataract is associated with anomalies. And sometimes the children are cooperative enough to sit here at the, at the age of two and a half years. And if actually they are not acquainted to sit for slit lamp examination, you should have in your practice this handheld slit lamp. You can go as early as two years or even as early as one year for slit lamp examination easily without general anesthesia. Intraocular pressure measurement is very important in cases of congenital cataract because as we said, may be associated with congenital glaucoma. You may measure it with a tunnel pen, but the most sensitive is the Perkins tonometer, which is usually used in pediatric age group. However, in uncooperative children and very young infants, general anesthesia is used and you should use a very safe anesthesia drug. You should have sevoflurane, which is not hepatotoxic and very safe for the, and that is, you don't fear any cardiac problems, hyperbradycardia or arrest. Moreover, it is not pungent. It induces rapid induction. See, anesthesia like that, it goes into sleep very easily. Rapid induction and rapid recovery. And then we can complete all exams on the general anesthesia. How can we perform biometric each other? If the baby is like that, is cooperative, and he can sit to measure the, cur the, the, the curvature of the cornea by the conventional autoref auto it's OK. <coughs> Otherwise, we have a special o an O2 keratometer, which measures the curvature of the cornea. And actually, it's a, it's a sort of a game. It displays music, and it displays uh, a sort of a, a beautiful teddy bear inside. So it's very interesting for the child. And it can measure the, the measurement of the keratometry. It's very easy. And sometimes we measure it in infants. However, if it is not possible, general anesthesia is used. Measuring the axial length is used by the A-scan ultrasound. In cooperative children, it can be measured in the clinic using the A-scan by meter. And in uncooperative children, it is measured under general anesthesia. If I'm using general anesthesia, how can I know that this is a good A-scan? I'm not focusing and there is, um, there is no, actually, I'm not over the visual axis. This is the criteria of a good A-scan. The corneal spikes and the lenticular spikes should be more than 15%, should reach the baseline here. So this is a poor scan. The vitreous here should be clear. This is a poor scan. Uh, the retinal uprise should be 90 degrees. Here, a poor retinal uprise. The retinal spike should be approaching 95 uh, from the baseline, 95%. This is a very low lateral spike. The scleral shadows <coughs> should be thick. Here, there is no scleral shadows. So this is a poor A scan you should repeat the axial length measurement. How can I choose the IOL power? Most of the pediatric cataract surgeons follow the, the hand guidelines. They stated that below two years of age, under correct by 
between two to five years under correct by 10%, and about five years go for amitropion. However, this is perfect, and all over the world is actually following this with the parameters, but it is not possible for our children in Egypt. It is possible if I have a child like that, here with sensory exotropia after pediatric cataract surgery, the parents are very cooperative, wearing the spectacles with under correction and going for embolioca therapy, and near a few months after surgery, the eye became straight. Fine, so I have then under correct the IOI power and fit the baby with the spectacles. But sometimes I have a baby under the age of two years and I give her emetropia. And even under the age of one year and I give her emetropia if I have unreliable parents. <laughs> I go for a hyperopia, an undercorrection, and the baby becomes severely amblyopic? No. I will go in these babies for emetropia, and then maybe I will go for ionic exchange later on. And if you have a child like that, bending his head to the floor, how can I fit him with spectacles, with the hyperopic spectacles? In such a child, I should aim for emetropia. Like surgical techniques. I would have, how can I go for cataract surgery without IOI implantation in infants under the age of under the age of two years? How can I go for the surgery? These babies, I will go for cataract surgery in both eyes and then fit the baby with aphic spectacles immediately after surgery. Step by step. We will start proceeding with the corneal ones, two corneal ones. They are uh, 90 degrees. Uh, over each other like that. And this MVR knife is 20 gauge and not 19 like that used in FACO. 20 gauge means the wound is 0.9 millimeters. And then we will go for anterior capsorexis. You should use a micro incision rexus forceps. In children we have the 23 gauge and even we have the 25 gauge rexus. It's a very tiny rexus forceps. And we make a large anterior rexus opening as large as possible, go for six or seven uh, capsorexis diameter, like that. And then, how can I go for the opening of the posterior capsule, posterior rexis? By the cystitome, I get the posterior capsule, inject, making it air, and inject into the burger space. How can I know that I'm inside the burger space and I'm not actually injecting into the vitreous? You will see this halo, rounded halo. If you see the viscoelastics like like a sort of a worm like that, it means that you did penetrate the vitreous and you are injecting inside the vitreous. And then, this is the rexus, the 25 rexus forceps. We can proceed with the posterior rexus as large as the anterior rexus. It should be very large. And they are nearly of the same size because I'm not implanting. I, I, I don't need a bag. And maybe I'm going to implant in the future but I need to be very large, to have a very large anterior and posterior axis. And then I go for the cutter here, the vitrectomy, extensive vitrectomy to remove part of the anterior vitreous. Sometimes in microphthalmic eyes, I go for a peripheral iridectomy, or if the pupil is undilatable during surgery, we can go for peripheral iridectomy, and it is preferable to do it by the cutter. Then we close these two ones, despite they are being very tiny ones, we still close them by sutures. And here at conclusion of the surgery, two ones are closed by the sutures, and these are the anterior and posterior rexines. If we go for surgery, and then you did the posterior rexis like that, this is not enough. You may enlarge this posterior capsorexis by a cutter. It has to be large, nearly of same size as the anterior axis. Here, these eyes, a few years later, we can implant secondary intraocular lens after the age of two years. Can you see here the capsular support, the fibrosis of the anterior and posterior capsule, where you can implant secondary uh, IOL. This at time of secondary IOL. In this case, it becomes very easy, and it's going to be a 10-minute surgery. We open here by a keratin 3 millimeter, and we enter the intraocular lens and place it in the sulcus very easily, and we close by sutures over the fibrotic anterior and posterior axis. 
We should not go what is written in books five and three millimeters. Five rexes, anterior rexes, and three millimeter posterior rexes. Why? It will end like that. Fibrosis and occlusion of the visual axis, and you will get the baby another time for surgery to clear the visual axis. If you want to, to go for cataract surgery with IOL implantation, and this is indicated in unilateral at below the age of two years, or unilateral above the age of two years, or bilateral above the age of two years. To start with, we enter the eye by a side port using MVR920 gauge, and then immediately we inject viscoelastic. And the side port from the other side, through a nylon clock position, with the keratome from above, don't start by the keratome, there will be collapse of the eye, and once collapse occur, people will close immediately. And fluctuation of the anterior chamber during surgery is very bad. It will invite inflammation after surgery. The eye should be full all the time with viscoelastic. How can we go for anterior capsorexis? We use trypan blue stain only in total cataract uh, to stain the anterior capsule in order to facilitate anterior capsorexis like that. And here, we are planning to implant interocular lenses, so the anterior rexis should be five millimeters, not more, not like uh, without interocular lens. It should be exactly five in order to cover the surface of the IOL by one millimeter because the IOL optic is six millimeters. However, with the new Lomera microscopes, we, we now perform the anterior, it enhances the red reflex. See, this is without enhancement, and here with enhancement of the red reflex, I can see the red reflex perfectly, so we can perform anterior rectus without stains in infants and children. However, in, in some uh, surgeons prefer, even if they see the red reflex, they prefer to use the trypan blue stain to stain the anterior capsule, not for the sake of visualization, but it changes the elasticity of the anterior capsule and make it less elastic. Now, we will, how can we start the anterior axis in such children? We go by the cystitome, and it should be paracentral. You should not start periphery, like the adults. And you should, not go, you should not go with a straight line and then invert the flap and then push the flap. No, there is no role for such a thing in children. You go for a tiny hole, and that's it. A puncture in the anterior capsule, and then hold it by the micro incision rexus forceps, and then rotate it in a circular fashion. How can we rotate it? Now I want to enlarge it a little bit. If I want to enlarge, I will go from the edge like that, and then proceed tangential, parallel to the edge of the axis. Okay? I'm afraid it may escape, so I will regrasp it again, and then I will pull towards the center. So it's a combination between being parallel to the axis edge and centric pita. You never pull outside, because it, it has a tendency to go outside and then frequent grasping and pulling towards the center. Why pulling towards the center like that? Because it is extremely elastic. And then frequent grasping until it ends into a pear-shaped opening, five millimeter exactly as you aim. Hydrodissection, how can we go for hydrodissection? We go with this cannula just underneath the anterior capsule and we elevate the anterior capsule a little bit and then proceed, proceed until it reaches the edge of the pupil and then we start to inject. Sometimes we see here the wave proceeding, but in many cases we don't see the wave. We depend upon viscoelastic coming outside the wound. It means that the fluid actually moved and it came outside the wound. And then we go for hydrodilination, and in the metal cataract, you will see the metal part extruding into the anterior chamber like that. It is very important to go for hydrodissection in order to facilitate irrigation aspiration. But take care. Hydrodissection and hydrodilination is condemned. You should not do it in certain cases. Like what? Like not all posterior polar cases. Like this baby we are suspecting that there is a sort of a defect in the posterior capsule. Look here, before start of the surgery, bring the eye to the highest magnification and examine the lens. Can you see this ring? This is not the anterior.